Well, hey kids, you know, I actually like to start these things off with like a mu clever musical interlude, you know, a song that involves revolution, etc., etc., and I found that my laptop actually just blots everything out, and then you end up listening to three minutes of distortion and silence. So that's not going to happen. We're just going to get right into it. This is often called the Age of Revolutions, and I'll bet if you're incredibly, incredibly clever, you'll have an idea as to why it's called that. This is a lot of revolutionary activity. Now, you might stop the film for a second and ask yourself, what's a revolution? Now, if you say it's a change, you're right, but if I were to move my hand from my knee to my nose, is that a revolutionary act? Not so much. What we're talking about is a dramatic change over a relatively short period of time. Now, we go back to the early days of human history, the Neolithic Revolution. My goodness, that occurred over thousands of years. But that's a relatively short period of time, given the fact that human beings, of course, have been around for 200,000 years. So a dramatic change from small groups of hunters and gatherers to, wow, small settlements of, you know, 1,000, 3,000 people with the year-round agriculture, that's a pretty revolutionary change. You see yourselves now in the, like I said, mid-18th century to early 20th century, a period of dramatic revolutions. Um, you know, largely this makes sense. The world is becoming smaller. It's changing. We have an industrial revolution, which of course is not political, but it has political fallout. That's a big part of what we see. We have a communications revolution. In other words, the printing press, which becomes re improved and refined. And that sort of leads to possibilities of different ways of thinking about things. We will not cover all of these by any means. We're mainly at this point looking at the Atlantic revolutions in this unit. But notice that it's happening throughout the world. So the first four you're seeing here, American, French, Haitian, Latin American, the Bolivarian revolutions. And yes, your country, Bolivia, is a part of that. Well, that would be the... Uh, the Atlantic revolutions, but you also see reform movements in Egypt. You see a whole bunch of revolutionary activity later in Europe. Um, you see the Meiji Restoration Japan, very, very key. You see the Ottoman Empire falling apart. You see a Mexican Revolution, dramatic impact, and the Chinese Revolution. By the end of this time period, you're going to see that, in fact, the Chinese empirical system, the dynastic system that goes back, gosh, I don't know, 4,000 years pretty much disappears. Now, again, maybe this is just a 120-year pause, and the next emperor will be appointed when you guys turn 37 years old, but as of this point, seems to be over. Main ideas of these Atlantic revolutions, again, American, French, Haitian, and Latin American ideas. Popular means people. Sovereignty means power. So, Political power comes from the people. There is no divine right of kings any longer. Limitations to government, constitutional limitations. Uh, Britain in 1688 had an unpopular king. He was a James. I think James II sounds right to me. And James II was disliked by the major movers and shakers in Parliament. They said, James, go away. And he left. New kings came in. Actually, king and queen brought in from the Netherlands, of all places, William and Mary. You might have heard of a university called William and Mary. William and Mary came in, but before they were put on the throne, they had to sign a guarantee, a bill of rights, a guarantee that parliament was supreme and that the king and queen, the monarchy, had relatively limited power. The ideas of freedom, equality, freedom of religion, expression, assembly, political equality, the idea of born aristocrats who simply have more rights than anybody else because they're born in the right family. However, however, notice in the red, it's not extended to all. If you were a woman, if you were a peasant, a laborer, God help you if you were a slave, if you were poor, none of this applied to you. In Britain, they called it virtual representation. For the ideas of Britain, well, we are a constitutional democracy, we have a representative government, but only about 4% of British adults actually voted for members of parliament. By virtual representation, though, the idea was that we who vote for parliament and we who serve in parliament 
we don't just serve our own interests. We also look out for the others. Uh, to be sure, we've already talked about the Enlightenment, the idea of scientifically, logically, through education, developing a better society, maybe not perfect, but doing this in a logical way, forgetting about tradition, forgetting about superstition. Logically, we work out what's best. All of this is a part of the picture. Take a look here at North America. Now, South America, I think you already know, is almost entirely Spanish and Brazil Portuguese controlled. There is also some French and Dutch presence, but relatively little. You see who we have here, though, in the Americas, this North America, 1713. You see the Spanish territory, the French in the middle, and the English colonies. Um, of course, the English colonies for North America end up being the most significant because that eventually turns into a English-derived United States and Canada. For the most part, the British had a hands-off approach. Um, uh, uh, achoo! Ah, did I just hear you say salud? What does salud mean? It means health. Salutary. Neglect. Healthy. Neglect. What this means is that the colonies, far from Britain, uh, you know, we had printing presses, but it took weeks to get messages across. In effect, as long as the colonies are achieving their main purpose, which is bringing wealth back to the master country, uh, not trading with under other countries, making England a wealthier place, frankly, the colonists were allowed to do pretty much what they wanted to do. If a colony like Rhode Island wanted to allow total religious freedom, that was fine with the British. Uh, if they wanted to elect their own assemblies to raise taxes, that was fine with the British. So it was a neglect of not paying attention, but one that mostly benefited people in the colonies. We see a big change in 1754. It's called the French and Indian War. Now, I'm going to assume that you're going to assume that this means the French fought against the Indians. The Franco-Prussian War was the French against the Prussians. It's not the case. This is the British name for this, and it is the French and most Native American tribes in the North American colonies fighting against the British and their American colonists. This was also, by the way, a part of the so-called Seven Years' War, which radically changes Europe and actually Asia as well. It's, it's often considered to be the first world war in some ways. That actually formally lasts in Europe from 1756 to 1763, hence the Seven Years' War. The French are out of North America. The British now control double the territory. But there are problems. First of all, it was an expensive war, and it was funded from the taxpayers back in England. Major debts developed. And what the British start to do is they say, wait a minute, we've got this extra territory, but let's face it, it benefits our American colonists above all. They're the ones who have access to the land. You know what? We need help paying off our national debt. Let's start passing laws that will force the colonists to pay these off. So again, here is our French and Indian War part of the Seven Years' War. Why I used two slides for that, I could not tell you. Here is the new North America at the end of the French and Indian War. And you'll notice there's no more France here. There is a huge English control. By the way, in the Northwest, Russia, Spain, both claim it, but not many people there at all per se. Um, you'll notice that there's a nice red line running through the English colonies. This is a, not a terribly big, but a, um, a mountain chain called the Appalachians. One of the things that the British do at the end of the war, because you better believe that most of the colonists say, oh my goodness, this is now British land and we can spill out and get big farms and we can start producing and making more money. Uh, the British want to keep the colonists along the coast. And one of the reasons is they want to control the taxation. It's going to be awfully hard to tax somebody along the Mississippi River, much easier if they're on the East Coast. Also, you have economic interests back in England. They don't want colonists going, squatting on land, taking it and owning it. They want to buy it themselves cheaply and sell it for more money. 
And there's also the concern that the Native American tribes are still out, of course, in that new territory that used to be French, and it would cost the British government more money to secure this for the colonists. The British announce a whole bunch of measures to try to raise money to pay off this war debt. Uh, among them, like I mentioned, keeping the colonists confined to the East Coast. They have taxes on sugar, taxes on tea. A fairly key one is a stamp tax. In other words, a tax on any document that gets an official stamp or seal from the British government. So that means that if you are buying something and you get a deed of purchase, you have to pay money back to the British government. Uh, fairly key to this, if you were publishing newspapers, you had to pay a tax for the official stamp of the British government. Keep in mind that newspaper owners were not happy about this. Newspaper owners are major influencers of public opinion. Uh, Patrick, Patrick Henry literally said in this, this debate about all this extra taxation, he was a member of the Virginia House of Commons or House of uh, House Legislature. Give me liberty, give me death. We saw massive protests within the colonies um, against the taxation, against the limitations. And this includes boycotts. It includes sometimes violence and sabotage. The key was no taxation without representation. If you're going to tax us, we deserve a voice. Again, to the British, this didn't make a lot of sense because most people did not have a voice in electing representatives. It was understood that the members of parliament looked out for everyone. This was not something satisfactory to a lot of the American colonists, especially because they had been allowed in the past more or less free reign. This is a big key, 1776. I mean, we, uh, to be clear, the protests against the British begin in the 1760s, but the idea of an independent United States, independent American colonies really didn't occur to most people. And even though there had been, by early 1776, there had been some armed conflict, it was really understood by the vast majority of people in the colonies that they were not fighting for a brand new, free, independent country. This is the book that changes this in so many ways. Thomas Paine was living in the colonies. He was a Brit, wrote a book, a pamphlet, really, 30, 40 pages called Common Sense. Here was the argument. Most colonists were saying, oh, this British King George III, this parliament, they're being terrible to us. They must change their policy. Thomas Paine argues in January of 1776 that the problem is not the king being a jerk, although he is. The problem is not an unresponsive parliament, although they are unresponsive. The problem is we are a huge territory of land, thousands of miles from England, with abundant natural resources, and even with the best king and the best parliament imaginable, it made no sense at all to stay a part of England. In other words, it is common sense that we part from England. Now, these are only words, but at the time they were written, when tensions were growing, when people were becoming more and more frustrated with the British, a guy publishing this, it gets spread around. It's thought that it sells about 200,000 copies, which is a huge amount. We're talking about 3 million British colonists. So one of every 15 people actually bought one. Also, it was passed around from hand to hand. Some historians argue that virtually every single literate American colonist, and most American colonists, unless they were slaves, uh, were literate. They could read and write, were aware of the arguments. Six months later, the United States formally declares independence. So there's Thomas Paine. You can have a look at that. 100,000, I said 200,000. I was wrong argued for independence. The problem is not the king or the parliament. And this leads us to a formal declaration of independence in which the American colonists declare their, yes, independence. You know what? It's John Locke. That's really what you're looking at here. It is an argument. It says at first that 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 in the opening paragraph, it simply says that the colonists, that, that government exists only to protect the rights of the people. If government does not protect those rights and starts to damage people, well, then we need to overthrow that government. 
The second part is a list of evidence, things that the British government has done that's unfair to the American colonists. Therefore, we declare ourselves independent. So July 4th, 1776. War for independence lasts eh, about five or six years to pen. Most of the fighting is really over by 1781. Uh, the colonists, however, do manage to force the British out. Keep in mind that the colonists do not destroy England. They don't invade London. What they do is simply make it too expensive and too difficult for the British to keep fighting. You'll see that if you, you look at this on the surface, you would assume, well, the British will win this. They have a much bigger population, the world's biggest army, by far the world's leading economic power. They have a stable government. It's one thing to declare independence, but then, uh, how do we run things? Who's in charge, etc.? And keep in mind, by no means are all colonists in favor of independence. Most estimates say that about 20 to 30 30% or so of the white colonists in the colonies are probably loyal to England. And, you know, even some of those who are sort of supporting the independence movement could probably change their mind pretty quickly if things are going badly. By the way, most Native Americans within the colonies are terrified of the American colonists. The British at least put some limits on expansion. And you can argue to the degree that African slaves were, were really very aware of what was happening, of course, because reading and writing was not common among them. But you can certainly argue that independence for the American colonies was the worst thing that could happen to Africans and African Americans, because the British are definitely starting to limit the slave trade, limit slavery, and you'll see that slavery simply explodes in the new colonies. Well, how did the colonists win this? Number one, fighting on their own field. This is helpful. They tend to have the support of the people. They know the land better. They know how to make their escapes. You know, fighting for a cause, this is absolutely huge. Look, many of the British soldiers sent over from London, 19-year-old kids, you know, they may have believed in their country. They may have been very brave, but ultimately their goal was to survive, live to see another day. Well, these colonists are fighting for their country. You can see a parallel when the United States, the greatest power of the 1960s, went to war with little, tiny, peasant farmer, North Vietnam. And you know what? The North Vietnamese just, they just clobbered the United States. And at, at one point, it was a Vietnamese general who said, one thing the Americans don't understand, to them, Vietnam is a war. To us, it's our country. And I think you can certainly make that parallel across 200 years' time. Had to only not lose. That sounds like bad grammar, but actually it's not. In other words, the colonists never needed to defeat Great Britain. That wasn't going to happen. They had to keep fighting, make it difficult. And by the way, do you see this in today's world? Resistance in Iraq and Afghanistan to, the, to American invasion over the last 15 years? Look, Iraq is never going to be able to invade the United States. Afghanistan is not going to take over Washington, D.C., but they continue to make it difficult for the United States. The United States, by the way, has, a, as of this telling, has spent over six trillion dollars on wars in Iraq in Afghanistan, and frankly, it's more unstable than it was 18 years ago. This is an endless war, certainly lessons to be learned from history. And like the Taliban of today, like the ISIS, Al-Qaeda, guerrilla war. Now, the British found this to be so, so uncivilized. What gentlemen do in war is they line up in neat regiments and they aim their weapons, and they fire, and there is a dignified way of waging war. Well, obviously, if the American colonists had tried to match armed army against armed army, they would have been clobbered, and they knew this. So what did they do? They blew up things. They fired and ran. They set traps. To the British, this was uncivilized. To the Americans, it's a way to win. And again, let's think about Afghanistan. The Taliban, the Islamists there, if they lined up on the battlefield against American army, they would be destroyed within seconds. So they plant bombs, they launch explosives, it's all undercover attack. 
Uh, this is the same tactics used by the Vietnamese against the United States in the 1960s and 70s. Again, after the war, an American general said to a Vietnamese general at a meeting afterwards, said, look, you know, every single time we went to war with you in battle, army against army, we clobbered you. And the Vietnamese general leaned back and said, well, that is true. It is also irrelevant. And again, same thing, British army on colonial army, they generally won, but the colonists found other ways. And the big key, the French. The French come to heavily support the colonists in this battle. Now, let's think about this. A French monarchy is supporting the colonist right to rise up against a monarchy. That doesn't seem like a very comfortable precedent. Stop the film for a while and tell me why you think France could possibly support a group of ragtag colonists rising up against a monarchy. And I hope that you're covering your head right now because I'm about to bop you upside your head. Balance of power. The French main rival was England. Take the colonies away from England, France gains through that. So your enemy's enemy is your friend. That has been very, very bad advice for many, many countries and many people over the years. And in fact, this war in the United States that France leads to makes it successful for the colonists ends up destroying the French monarchy within about 15 years. But nonetheless, that's why the colonists are able to, well, win or not lose, which meant they won. New Treaty of Paris, you see the United States up to the Mississippi River. That is all the United States. Uh, the French are out. I will point out that the French eventually, that area of Louisiana, which you say, wait a minute, isn't that what Napoleon, French leader, sold to the United States in 1803? Napoleon, by 1803, had invaded Spain, taken over Spain, and what you see as Louisiana is actually under French control at that point. That's why the French are able to sell the Louisiana Purchase to the United States in 1803. Always love this. Abigail Adams, who is the wife of the second president of the United States, John Adams. John Adams was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, was key going off to Philadelphia to create a new constitution, a way of running the country. She wrote to him, by the way, in this new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Now, you can read that as a request, but by the end, I think you can read that as a warning. John, this should not be a male-dominated government, and if you try to make it so, you're sleeping on the couch. At this point, the idea of political or other equality for women is crazy. No one is paying attention to it. No one considers it. Well, some people consider it. And Abigail Adams, I would certainly call an early feminist. What is a constitution? Uh, you know, it's like a constitution. What is it? It's a law. It's not a law. A constitution is a framework for laws. It's a written statement, although actually you can have traditional constitutions that are not written, but a written statement outlining the basic laws or principles by which a country is organized. I want you to think of a constitution as being like a bookshelf, and then you put papers, i.e. laws, in structured, organized places. So it basically says within a government what will be allowed, what types of laws, how power should be. United States Constitution, hey, we saw this earlier. It is based on popular sovereignty. Popular, people, sovereignty, power. The first three words of the United States Constitution, we, the people, form this government. Again, who are the people? Everyone in the United States? Well, it's certainly not black people, and it's certainly not women, and it's certainly not poor men, and it's certainly not Native Americans. It's a fairly small percentage of the population, and that's something that the United States still wrestles with today. Limited government? Didn't we already see this? Absolutely. 
The Constitution, as you'll see in U.S. government in a couple of years, specifically lays out what government can and can't do. Separating powers. The idea that if you put all the power in the hands of a king or a president, that's where you get dictatorship. Again, you'll cover this more in government in a couple of years. But what we're looking at here is the idea that the president has some powers. Ooh, but the legislature, the Congress can block those powers. Ah, but the president can block the Congress. And then we have a court system that can block both of them. But then the court system is also controlled in some ways by the legislature, by the executive. And this is the real key. And this was the hang up. Individual liberties. And there was so much debate about this. Should we put specific things in the Constitution? You have the right to freedom of religion, the right to freedom of speech. One problem is that it was hard to agree upon which rights were there, which rights should be there. There are also those who said, hey, I'm worried. If we list, say, 13 individual rights that people have, does that mean that they have no other rights? Because the war had not ended that long ago, because the United States colonists, well, the new United States felt like they needed a government, there was an agreement was made. The agreement was, let's ratify this Constitution as it is. And then the first thing that the new Congress will do is agree upon a list of individual liberties. These are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, and they're collectively called the Bill of Rights problem in this new democratic, freedom-loving, equality-promoting system, you had a pretty incredible degree of inequality. Uh, slave population in the colonies at the time of the American Revolution, something like three, four hundred thousand. I don't recall the exact number. By 1860, there are four million slaves. The American Revolution leads to an explosion of slavery. And again, shocking to us today. This is not something that is hidden. This is not human trafficking like we looked at in, in human rights. It's to be sold on this day a cargo of 94 prime healthy Negroes. And you recall Michael W. Twitty writing about the auction blocks. Again, a fugitive slave, a runaway. It is our right. This is my property. You must help him return to me. Slavery is in the original U.S. Constitution. Interestingly, the word slavery is not. It was rather an unpleasant word. It, it, it looks kind of harsh. It looks like it's not that civilized. So the word is not used. So there's all this dancing around language. Those persons who are considered in labor yet not considered free, uh, what? Oh, slaves. One big debate was, hey, how do you count the new population? The idea was that taxation, the bigger the population of one of the new states, the more in taxes they paid. Also, the more representatives they had in government. So you would find the southern slaveholding states of the United States saying, well, Certainly, slaves are human beings, and so we deserve more representatives in the new Congress. But let's face it, they're not productive, they're slow, they don't work hard, we shouldn't have to pay taxes on them. The northern states said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You make money off of your slaves. By God, you're paying taxes based on that population. But you don't give these people the most basic rights. You're not getting more representatives. The compromise? Slaves were counted as three-fifths of a human being. Let that settle in for just a moment. In other words, counting the number of people in the room, one, two, three, three and three-fifths, four and three-fifths, five and one-fifth, six and one-fifth, six and four-fifths. That's exactly how this worked. Big debate about the slave trade, the horrible slave trips coming over from Africa. Um, there was a stronger movement. Even those who were pro-slavery kind of felt the slave trade was maybe not totally nice. Well, here's the agreement. Congress can debate an end of the slave trade, but not for at least 20 years, not until 1808. Uh, the slave trade is legally banned overseas in 1808, but of course, people can still be bought and sold within the United States. 
And then Article 4, Section 2 is called the Fugitive Slave Clause. Bottom line, if your property, if your chair were to get up from the state of Georgia and run across on its little legs and end up in Massachusetts, the people in Massachusetts would be guaranteed to return, promised and forced to return that chair to its rightful owner. Of course, chairs, pieces of furniture don't get up and run away. Human beings do. And so runaway slaves, according to the Constitution, must be returned. The bottom line, the U.S. Constitution guaranteed the right to hold slaves. And there it is, the Constitution of the United States of America. And again, those key words at the top, we the people. That's it for this section on the British and the American Revolution and the forming of a new United States. Be moving on in a little bit to the French Revolution next time.